second item on our agenda this evening is a presentation by Jonathan Ross regarding the 2023 Canada Games. So I welcome you, Jonathan Ross. Thank you for coming, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having us here this afternoon. Uh, it's our pleasure to bring you an update from the 2023 Canada Winter Games. For those of you that I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Jonathan Ross, and I'm the volunteer chair for sponsorship and revenue generation for the 2023 Canada Games. And with me this evening is my colleague Chris Beauvais, uh, who is with Canada Games 2023 in the sponsorship and revenue generation area as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris now to get started on a short presentation, and then uh, I'll be back with some closing comments. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and I uh, just want to express our thanks once again uh, for allowing us to be here today this afternoon. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Canada Games as it is. Uh, we, uh, we are hosting the Canada Games 2023, February 16th to March the 4th of 23. It'll be our third time hosting the event, and for myself personally, it's my second time at the kick of the can. I was back at the summer uh, event back in 2009, which was a, a m most memorable experience for myself. It was just amazing to be part of. Uh, just a brief history of the Canada Games themselves. It's a uh, it's a national it's a, it's a slide states. It's a national but a local feel. Uh, the games traditionally have been are held in grassroots markets, uh, not in larger cities, not in the Toronto's, the Montreal's, and so forth. Uh, we go to grassroots development because that's where all the athletes and all the uh, future generation that's where they strive to earn their uh, their uh, their future. So uh, we pretty well. Uh, are centered around all the uh, smaller communities. And we're, again, once again, we're very fortunate to be uh, hosting our third event. Uh, the Games itself, it's the largest amateur sport competition in Canada. Uh, there's, uh, it alternates between summer and winter years, every two years. Uh, the Summer Games in 21, unfortunately with the pandemic, are moved to, they're being hosted in Niagara, and that will be in August 22. So with our event, we're gonna be held six months after the Summer Games, which is the first. Uh, so uh, we'll be uh, working lots together with the Niagara group to be able to, uh, to put together our world class event together. Uh, there's 22 communities across Canada that have hosted the games and over 700 uh, communities uh, that represent athletes from across the country. Uh, the four year time span between winter games, because it skips every two years, uh, we say there's approximately a million athletes between 13 and 23 years of age trying to get to the Canada games in that four year cycle. And a lot of it's based on birth here as well. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, progression for the kids uh, working towards their ultimate goal and getting to the Canada Games and ultimately to international competition. Uh, as well with, uh, we've, we found over the last five to seven years, uh, the Canada Games, the awareness across the country has grown immensely. As you can see from some of the statistics on the screen, uh, TSN has been a partner with us the last few games. And uh, the coverage that they provide to us on both English and French uh, networks is, uh, is, uh, is unbelievable. Uh, our viewership has increased again year after year in the games. Uh, so there's a lot of engagement, promotion of those communities, and everything that we do across for ourselves, for PEI, across the uh, province during the games itself. Uh, we're stretched out into YouTube webcasting big time over the last couple of games as well. And as you can see, our viewership is, uh, is staggering. Uh, we have, again, so now we're being able to engage uh, the families that can attend the Canada Games across the country to bring everything into their rooms. Yeah. Uh, alumni, again, uh, it's grown every year pretty well to the last Olympics. Again, it's a stepping stone to international competition for all of our national athletes. And again, uh, those statistics don't truly show because of, the, again, I touched on earlier with birth year, uh, not every not every youth is eligible to participate. It's all based on birth year specific sports. So those numbers are probably actually higher than they're showing. Yeah. And just a brief uh, scan on alumni. There's some uh, great names that have participated on the level, uh, both at the uh, international, provincial, regionally, across the world. And of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of names you recognize there, and our own uh, PEI has more since there as well. Uh, I touched on earlier about the games coming up. Uh, Niagara is hosting them in August 22 through the pandemic. It's supposed to be this coming August. Uh, we're going to be hosting them, like I said, in February 23. And it's sticking out here on the East Coast in 25. It's going out to Newfoundland, 
Our, our brief little skip out to the Yukon in 27 and back to New Brunswick in 29. Our games themselves, I could remember the dates, is the 17th of February to March the 4th. Over that 16 day period, we'll be hosting 3,600 athletes over a two week period. Uh, our games is very unique. It's not in one community where we're going to be utilizing the whole province uh, due to the infrastructure required, the facilities, and the framework. And our, but at the end of the day, we're looking to put on a, a world class event and something that all participants involved will remember forever. Uh, we also require 5,000 volunteers, so we're just starting in that stage now. Uh, we have all of our senior staff in place, and we're going to be hitting the community pretty soon to uh, try to recruit that big number. And again, our spectators are thousand for uh, estimated approximately 100,000, and that's going to be on site and again uh, coming in and out. And uh, so the economic impact to our, our province is going to be uh, it's going to be awesome. Our sporting venues are. A few of our memorandums of understanding aren't in place yet, but we can uh, localize on our, uh, briefly on our map there. The games themselves is going to be held in the three provinces. Uh, due to the fact we have two sports that we can't accommodate because we don't have the facilities. Uh, so we're going to be going tip to tip with all of our sport competitions. We'll be going tip to tip with all of our cultural events and entertainment, and we'll be engaging the whole province for that two week period. And the two and the period from you know uh, we're, we're going to be doing our launch brand in February of this year, so when that kicks in, we'll be engaging the, the whole province really for the next two year period. Uh, I touched on we'll be going out to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Uh, Nova Scotia, we uh, we need the Oval and Halifax for the long track speed skating, and we'll be going to Crab Mountain outside Fredericton for the alpine skiing events. Uh, and, and briefly, our sports. Traditionally, uh, we have the traditional winter sports, but uh, we have the, all the uh, other ones such as fencing, gymnastics, uh, uh, judo, karate, uh, yeah, uh, table tennis, uh, squash. So there'll be a number of cross-section type of seasonal sports as well. And uh, like I said, we're looking to have a great, great uh, world-class event, and uh, we, we're really looking forward to it. I'll let John to jump in here now with a few other comments. Thanks, Chris. So when PEI, Canada's smallest province, won the bid to host the 2023 Canada Games, it afforded us the opportunity to partner with communities like Stratford across the province to host the highest level of sport, which of course will enable, will leave a lasting legacy, both from an infrastructure point of view, but also from an experiential point of view. Um, as Chris alluded to, the Canada Games, the next four out of, or sorry, three out of four or five Canada Games will be in the uh, Atlantic Canada region. That's uncommon. It is not our turn to host in 2023. Uh, it was actually going to be Nunavuts, but 2023 is actually coincides with, as many of you probably are aware, with PEI's joining 150th anniversary of PEI joining Confederation. So our Premier at the time thought it would be very fitting when Nunavut took a pass that uh, we put our hat, throw our hat in the ring and make a bid, uh, which we won, we were awarded it a couple of years ago um, to host. So it'll be a great way to kick off the celebrations uh, for that year uh, with hosting the nation in uh, the middle of February into, the er into early March. <clears throat> our goal is, to, again, to partner with communities like Stratford to create a life-changing experience not only for those that will be hosting but also your community residents um, experiences that will create economic impact in the community it will increase your community visibility not only on a national basis but on an international basis um, and it's really going to uh, enable us to show our passion and our pride in our communities to the rest of to the rest of the nation and of course leaving a le lasting legacies there will be, a, as Chris alluded to, a volunteer program. There's going to be over, we're going to need over 5,000 volunteers uh, to put these games on. So of course there'll be lots of opportunity to have your community residents volunteer, be engaged, and be committed to the games. Next slide. We'll also have a community connection program, uh, which is going to consist of a bunch of things, not the least of which will be a torch relay. So we'll be going across the uh, province, visiting communities, Stratford will obviously be a stop along the way of the torch relay. 
of course start in Niagara, may even go over into, it might even be a maritime wide torch relay given that we do, we will have facilities over at Crab Mountain and in Halifax. There'll be a mascot program, which I think will be key in Stratford given that you have two uh, large elementary schools. So the mascot program um, is, it's an experiential learning program. It includes wellness programs, etc for um, school-aged children, and also uh, Island students will be naming our mascot as well. It'll be a, a naming competition. There's gonna be uh, speakers bureaus hosted across the uh, province where we'll bring in, a, you know, Canada Games alumni, both on the sport, uh, on the official, and on the business side of things. Uh, we'll be open to the public um, with different speaking uh, events going on. Community celebrations uh, leading up to the games and of course during the games and post games and we'll have business engagement programs throughout the province as well. So from an economics point of view, just keep going, great, uh, there'll be over 30,000 visitors coming to PEI uh, in February, which of course is not our traditional tourist season, uh, so it'll be nice to have our hotels, restaurants, etc. full in, in February, March. There'll be over $100 million in economic spin-off, and that doesn't include a lot of the infrastructure uh, that will be built here. You'll, you may have noticed, I'm sure you've all noticed, the residents going up at UPEI. That's going to be roughly a $63 million complex when it's completed. And quite frankly, uh, I don't know that it would be built without the Canada Games coming here. Having said that, the Canada Games wouldn't have been awarded to PEI if it wasn't going to be built. So it's a great partnership. Um, that we have there with the university. Come games time, there'll be close to 700 direct or indirect jobs created, and during games time, we'll be one of, if not the largest employer in the province. Over 700 VIPs will be visiting the province. When I say VIPs, that will be prime ministers, governor generals, premiers, ministers of sport, etc., CEOs, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Over 500 officials medical personnel and media will be visiting the province, and of course 150 mission staff from Canada Games Council and the various missions from each of the provinces. We stole a tagline from your brochure, imagine that. Um, we're actually, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to share with you this evening that we're in current discussions right now with the Stratford Soccer Complex to host uh, gymnastics during the first week of competition and trampoline during the second week of competition. I also understand that uh, the Island Gymnastics Academy is in talks with the town about locating their new $2.7 million facility within the town limits. Um, they will also, they are uh, attempting to become a, a um, training facility, a uh, practice facility for the Canada Games and uh, we will work closely with the Town of Stratford, the Island Gymnastics Academy, ensuring that that complex gets built on time and of course meets the technical specifications so that it could be a training facility during the games and, and leading up to the games as well. Stratford, along with uh, Montague, will be one of the few communities that will host games uh, for the entire two week period. And I, I highlight Montague because of course, um, most will be traveling through your community to get to Montague, and no doubt will be purchasing gas and visiting your restaurants, etc., as they drive through Stratford on their way to Montague. There'll be, uh, you'll have lots of opportunity to engage with athletes. The average age is there between 15 and 23 years old. Of course, there'll be VIPs and their families. Most uh, VIPs will bring their families, and as I mentioned, that's, you know, prime ministers, uh, premiers, ministers of sports, etc. The sponsors and their families, which are business leaders, of course, uh, these are CEOs of some of the largest, both national and international companies, will be here on hand. Of course, team officials, and um, there'll be national and regional sponsors here as well. From a uh, pre games and engagement point of view, uh, we, we do have a very large uh, social media awareness and presence, and as Chris alluded to, that's becoming more and more prevalent as time goes on with YouTube and streaming. Um, we'll have, there'll be an opportunity to, to engage with all your residents, 
not only, of course, will there be sport going on during the games here, but we're going to have the torch relay, we're going to have the mascot program, um, and of course, we'll have lots of uh, volunteer recruitment and engagement activities going on in Stratford as well. So we do have a, a municipal, a couple of years ago, there was a municipal partnership program uh, created where the Canada Games Council and the federal government had, have gone to uh, host communities and quite frankly ask for, for support, financial support. Um, in 2019 at Red Deer, that worked out to about $212 per resident. Uh, currently in Niagara for 2022, uh, they have a little larger population base that they're drawing on, uh, but it's $92 per resident. And I should also specify here, um, I don't think it was mentioned that the Canada Games, its mandate is to create legacies in mid to small communities across the nation. You'll never see a Canada Games hosted in a Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver. Um, Winnipeg in 2017 was about as large a center as you'll see the Canada Games hosted in. So what we're asking of Stratford is $25 per resident. We actually have a two-level uh, municipal partners program here in the province. The larger municipalities, well, quite frankly, the two cities, are, uh, we were asking at $50 a resident. Uh, the next tier, we're coming in at $25 a resident, which Stratford would fit into. So we're asking for $25 a resident. Um, that can be amortized over four fiscal years starting in 2021. So there'll be a, a number of rights and benefits that will be uh, 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 given to Stratford if you do come on as a, as a partner. And you'll be, number one, you'll be, alluded, you'll be given the uh, title of a champion, tier sponsor, uh, which comes with a number of rights and benefits. And we'll be engaged with you all, all the way along. We'll have a complete marketing an engagement team in place. Um, as I mentioned before, lots of social media, recognition, um, et cetera. Anything you want to add to that, Chris? Uh, no, just, uh, yeah. uh, just the ones coming on board as a, a, a municipal partner, um, we will work together with you to promote the town and uh, right across from that, right through to the games. We'll also work with you. Our social media strategies are going to be very, very extensive. Uh, so if you have activities, programs, events going on in the community, uh, we'll be, you'll be able to reach out to all of our social channels as well. Uh, activation opportunities, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be on board. All of our sponsors, we have a couple of uh, summits, uh, free games, where we have all of our sponsors, regardless of level, uh, come to PEI for a three-day period. So you'll have access to all of those uh, people in the room to be able to promote the community and, uh, and have them enriched in what uh, you and provide here uh, in, the in the town of uh, As well, activation strategies, we'll work with you on any type of aspects that you want to do to, uh, pr uh, to promote the town. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's a partnership. Uh, we want to see what's best for everybody. And at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's, it'll help success, uh, the overall success of the games. Um, I'm just trying to look quickly here. Uh, as well, the social media, the VIP accreditations and so forth, uh, that's all that fun stuff, but uh, but the biggest thing is, is the working together, promotion of the community, getting people to come to the community, and we touched on as well the uh, a few things in your uh, in your uh, strategy moving forward. A couple slides back to work along with you to engage your community more, and the the aspects are community engagement uh, initiatives that we're going to be having for the games. We will do that for you, and uh, also we can work with you as a whole society and about sponsorship and assets and trying to create some value and some uh, some revenue coming in for your uh, for your sponsorship of assets. We can work with you and we'll have the people in the province, in the town, uh, during those two weeks to be able to showcase what you have here. Uh, we can assist you with evaluation and, uh, and the whole process. So uh, again, we just want to work together with you right through the process. Thank you. And we'll leave a hard copy of, of this presentation with the rights and benefits in it as well. Um, Happy to answer, entertain any questions. Any questions, uh, any counselors have? I have a question. Um, when you talk about payment, 
is this cash or can we provide uh, like we to have a community campus and we're thinking about um, leasing that land to organizations can that be put towards the cost of what you're looking for here if it's budget relieving yes okay that answer your question yeah i just wanted to clarify yeah if it's something that, if it's an outlay of cash that we budgeted for, and it relieves that, then yes. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. That was excellent. Uh, there was a lot of great information there, and in fact, if there are any questions, indicates we covered it here on all basis. So, so. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you did a great job, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the future. And we will be assessing your request, and we will get back to you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Minister Fox, their shared service with the capital regions. Can you elaborate that, the shared services? 
Yeah, we were asked to attend a meeting uh, to discuss uh, possibility of uh, um, leasing options for Stratford, and uh, um, from that meeting, there was a proposal to uh, the CAOs who work together to uh, uh, make a request to uh, ask for um, the minister to uh, to do a study looking at what the best policing option might be for Stratford, okay. as well as the capital capital area. Yeah. Old capital. Any other questions? If not, uh, I'll ask um, Chief Administrative Officer Robert Hughes for his report. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my report's in your package. Um, I did, was really happy to send out an email earlier today that we finally got the land uh, locked up for the campus. <laughs> so on to the next steps there. There's still lots to be done, but uh, that's a great hurdle to pass. And I emailed. Uh, our provincial friends right away to let them know that we have the agreement now and send them a copy of it and try to get uh, moving on the next steps. Um, I also want to thank council. We had a great staff team building day uh, last Friday. Um, I think the staff really appreciated it. I think we, we uh, made some, had some fun and, and, uh, and had some serious uh, discussion as well and made some good progress in our ongoing quest to try to make this the best place we can for the staff to work. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Happy to answer questions on any other items in there. I just want to comment, Robert. Uh, I think you did a fantastic job on, in terms of land acquisition. I know it was a rocky road. It was really difficult, a lot of uh, challenges, and uh, you persevered and, uh, and got us to the finish line. So I really want to thank you for that. You did a great job. I guess we all concur with that, Robert. Great job. So now from here on in, I guess it's a matter of uh, going to next steps and uh, <laughs> putting the plan together and having everything go on. Eh? We're just starting, really. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great, though. It's great stuff. Yeah. Great, great accomplishment. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you for your report. Okay, uh, we'll now move to safety services, and I'll ask Chair Derek Smith, uh, Councilor Derek Smith, for his report. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, under 10A is the safety services meeting that was held in October the 19th, 2020. Basically, all the information in this report is covered on uh, was covered on the last council meeting uh, because the council meeting uh, was before this. So it's basically rehashing last uh, month's council meeting. Um, it's pretty standardized. Uh, the, probably the biggest thing we have ongoing right now for our committee is the calming efforts for traffic in and around the Stratford area that is being worked on. Uh, other than that, that's pretty well it for that. Um, I do want to make mention that it is that time in our mandate that we do have turnover in our committees now. And I just want to reach out to my committee members on safety services. Uh, some are leaving for other duties. Uh, some are being switched to another committee and some are staying on. But I do want to thank everybody on my committee for their efforts and time over the last two years. It's much we appreciate it. Uh, any questions on safety services? Yeah. I have one there, Derek. Um, on your crossing guards there, are we looking now with the sports campus, community campus, hopefully the high school and the, and the junior schools now with elementary, are we looking at crossing guards or are we looking at an electronic device? Where does this electronic device come at? <laughs> if you take a drive to the Georgetown Road, yeah. they basically have something up there that I admire. It's basically, it's um, Flag person, which is a, a robot, I suppose you would call it, and it's just uh, activated by a button, and the arm comes down and flashing red lights. However, we all have to realize that we do not own the roads within the town. That is provincial government, and that's the first person we have to contact is provincial government to see what plans we can implement within the town. I'd be more interested in a, a human person looking after our children. Um, 
I'm just saying other communities do it, and I'm just saying with the, uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a make workshop for our residents of Stratford. It's uh, taking retirees out, sorry, taking retirees out and so on, and then give them four or five hours, uh, five, 15 hours a week. It'd be a great incentive for the residents. I mean, maybe an old guy like myself, retired, want to go to a cross guard, somebody with the kids, you know, just something like that. Want to look out of the future. Thank you. I think uh, we'll ask uh, Jeremy Crosby, our uh, director of infrastructure, to comment on that. Yeah, just, <clears throat> just add a couple of things to that. Um, we are dealing with the provincial government with regard to the request. Uh, Cornwall's going through a sim similar pilot program right now. Um, we'll watch closely what they're doing and, and how the provincial government is going to help out with that. But they also <clears throat> indicated to us that there could be some signalization that does go on in some of these intersections. It could be a permanent solution that's there oh, all right. throughout the day. So there's the various options we're looking at. Uh, like I said, we will be getting back to the Canadian Council on that. Okay, thank you. I would add too with the crossing guards, like uh, I drop kids off there. Um, there's only one crosswalk on Glen Stewart, right? Two schools. So at minimum, I think there should be another crosswalk at the other school as well, because the kids aren't going to walk up and so and then i also think it should be looked at bigger picture as well there's lots of busy intersections that kids have to go through to get to the school not just the intersections right at the school um i think of uh stratford and kinlock um there's lots of kids that you know come through busy intersections and so i would foresee this kind of bigger than just right at the school I, I, I'm thinking through the community as yeah. much as possible at those key intersections. Yeah. My two cents. Certainly are some major intersections that we're looking at. That Marion Drive is another one that uh, needs to be looked at. So and we're also looking at some traffic control devices on the Westwood Drive too. Uh, to try to slow the traffic down a little bit before it gets uh, to the school. So just various things that uh, the provincial government has agreed to, to look at with us, but uh, we've just got started on that. And it'll probably take over the winter months before we're able to come up with a solution. Yeah, I think there's more children with COVID. There's a lot more children walking and biking. Um, my daughter is one of them now. She's out there walking home from school now, which is new. Um, so yeah, um, there's a lot more kids. I know it's on the roads this year for sure. It's a, it's a big undertaking. The, 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 the crossing guards in Charlottetown come under the umbrella of the Charlottetown City Police. So they're overseeing the whole operation. So with that comes training. Uh, and it's not just like putting one crossing guard at the corner, you have to have backup. So, you know, you, you're looking at, uh, uh, it's a major undertaking. There's there's a liability there. There's, uh, if, I'm not sure if the RCMP would take that on, but if they didn't, we, it would certainly go through the town. And, and uh, so there's a lot more to it, but I, I, I agree that it is a good thing and I think we need it. But, uh, and I also think that some of the onus is on the province. So. Like Jeremy said, we'll be partner hopefully with them on that. Yeah. My understanding yeah. is that um, the um, we're looking at it, uh, at the safety service committee, which will be making a recommendation uh, to uh, to council on this. Is that is that correct? Yes and no. They're working with the Home and School Association to, to yeah. Let look at it. It's more of a we can make recommendations, but I think the citizenship of the town should maybe be contacted through whatever means we have, the, the feedback and stuff like that. It's much more than making us make a decision. It, it is, seems to be a small move, but it, it is a big move. Yeah, we need to, we need to have the costs and, uh, yeah, well, exactly. and the impacts and the risk yeah. and all that assessed and uh, yeah. have, a, have a recommendation uh, by yeah. safety services to I council. Mean, it is a new with set of trail systems in place. With bells. There, there's a lot of avenues here we have to look at. So it's, it's going to be, and after COVID is over, will the children be going back on the bus or will they stay walking to school? So the, the one thing is there is a time factor here. It is that, uh, you know, every day as it goes by without them, uh, where exactly. there's a lot of children, uh, you know, uh, they're potentially at risk and uh, I would like to see action on it as soon as possible. So uh, whatever 
whatever can be done in the, sh in, you know, the shortest time possible, I think would be um, the best solution from my perspective, in my opinion. Yeah, the, the light work was done on this probably back in 2016, and, and at that time, council decided not to go with the crossing direct. And, and as Councilor Flo indicated, it's not just hiring a council or a uh, crossing guard per per crossing. It's it's two crossing guards per crossing. If, if someone shows up sick or not, or not able to come to work, then there has to be someone to fill in. And whether or not the RCMP would, would be able to do that, uh, you know, the city police fill in for the crossing guards when they're not there. So it's there's quite a bit of information we have to, to go through. And like I said, we we're watching closely to see how Cornwall get along with the province uh, in their pilot program. So we're, we're going to move quick, but uh, we want to make sure we're doing the, the right thing and make sure that we have the, uh, the money in the budget to, uh, to complete this properly. Yeah. I mean, I agree with the mayor and with his comments. I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, we've got to act as quick as something, in this case something happens, right? I mean, we just put it together. Now, in my, over my career, 25 years or so, I was a file officer, and I organized this. I know how it's, it's not very difficult. Just have your crew together. You have your six or seven people, and if somebody phones sick, that's the other six guys. It's just a matter of putting together. And you're paying these people fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour, and, you can, and they're residents uh, from Stratford getting jobs part times. But it, you know, it's, it's just 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 a matter of somebody taking a ball and run with it. It's an excellent time to have the discussion. Yeah. The, the twenty-five thousand dollars per crossing that we're going to have to yeah. uh, incur in our budget, and the budget process is going to start here soon, unless we wanted to do a supplementary. We're going to have that information for the budget process for sure. Yeah, and, and I think the situation in Cornwall is a bit different. That it might be more comparable to uh, the Stratford Road, but even or Stratford and Kenlock Road, as uh, Councilor Burry suggested. But yes. The uh, the situation is is that it is being looked at. It, it will be you know the, the situation will be analyzed. There'll be a recommendation made, and then we'll be we'll be making a decision as part of the budget process. Uh, unless we decide to go, you know, it's of enough importance that we need to go to, to a supplementary budget for this year, in which case we'll be, whenever the, the work is done, you know, before, I don't know if community engagement is necessarily uh, required, but uh, we will have to look at that, if that is, that's been suggested by one councillor, so we will have to uh, look into it from a number of different angles, get the information, and uh, make a decision and move forward, so uh, um, whatever the model is. In Cornwall, it's a busy, busy road. It's a, you know, it's a, people are going from 80, 90 kilometers down to uh, down to 40, and uh, in our situation, it's a 60 kilometer run an hour road of the Kinlock Road. Nobody, I don't believe, is crossing. Nobody's proposing to have crossing guards on the Trans Canada Highway. I don't think. No. What, what they request is crossing guards in Glen Stewart. Yes. But we are looking at other areas too. And that's 30 kilometers an hour. Yeah. 25 on the school area. So. so I would like like to see it looked at maybe from just the perspective of risk and. Uh, and where it's most needed, and, uh, and and also consult with the home and school to see what their recommendations are as well. But really, to get an answer on it as, as quickly as possible. We'll, we'll have something for the budget for sure, and if we need something quicker, we will we'll get that information for you. Thank you. And, and what they've done in Charlottetown, they tried to get as many custodians at the schools to, to take on that uh, extra job because of their everyday. And the big thing was they knew the kids and the kids were comfortable with them, and, and a lot of times I, I've seen the kids follow the crossing guard up to the intersection to go across, and they, they'd wait for him at the school lane. And so yeah. it, it's good it's because they're, they're there, they're automatically there every day doing their job, and so they just pop up to the intersection at 12 and 4, whatever time it is, and you know, so it mean, worked out great. Thank you. If you're gonna do it right, you gotta have these people, background checks, uh, criminal record checks, or vulnerable sector checks, anything else, that these people gonna be working. You know, all that's with the kid, with you and the kids. So it's just, it's pretty simple. I just look at this because our town is so grown, and with with, with this, maybe this high schools going over, and the Jill talked about surrounding, just for surrounding streets and, and avenues and so on. That's what I'm looking at. I mean, and the McKinnon Drive or McKinnon Road there now is busy. I just, I mean, it's it's new to new, you know, it's new Stratford, right? We certainly have the numbers already. I yeah. Mean, brought that to the last meeting, but again, I was in discussions with the chief engineer, chief engineer with the province. He indicated there might be some other solutions we could look at. Um, we want them to be partners in this. They do all the roads in, in Stratford. So um, I think we, we have to have that discussion process. But if we wanted to proceed on our own, we definitely could. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, so another avenue we could take is in the Humane Society, we subcontract out to a company to look after it. Like we have bylaw officers here now we have to subcontract with. We have 
humane society, they look after a job situation. So we have to, we might have to look at a company taking over that job. That way we can. Uh, I think. Uh, I think job. before we go there, though, we we have to have discussions with the humane society, and we uh, want to have a recommendation society. from the city. I mean, somebody like that, a company. They're a great partner right now. They're, they're not great job as far as I'm concerned. No, I, I didn't mean he made a to take it over. I meant a company like that. Like they, uh, they had the bylaw officers that we have hired on. Maybe they could look at it. It's, or a, a white company somewhere in BDI they could look after it for. And we just pay them and they do it. But it's a lot, it, it, it's steps we have to take care of. And, and, then, and the people you hire are, are community people in the town. I mean, they're, they're, we have our, our committees or we're going to pass committees tonight for 80 or 90, 100 people. These people want to come out and contribute to the school. They want to get out. They, the people retire. They want to go out and get out of the house for three or four hours a day and, and speak to kids, see the kids, and want to do you know good, great things. It's just pretty simple. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, street light reports. I don't believe we have anything this month, Jeremy, for street lights. Uh, nope. Okay. CRCP report. Uh, okay, I did ask for an RCP officer here tonight. Apparently, uh, our Glenn Dudley is still in the Nova Scotia area, fishery dispute, and the second in command was unavailable, and I, they might have got tied up in the call. I don't know the reasons we're not here. However, uh, the activity sheet for the month, pretty standardized. Indice checks 58, which is down from last month. However, that's the way it is. And the traffic tickets are in their slots, are 39 for the month. Uh, warning tickets are 16, and number of complaints 131. Pretty standardized month for the town strategy. Uh, do we have any questions on statistics? I just have a Corporal Dudley does a fantastic job, and, and I know why he's not here tonight, but the question I have for is maybe finance and Robert Hughes is, uh, you know, when Dudley leaves for another province, um, do we have, is he fill in, who pays, who pays for when he goes to Nova Scotia for a couple months? I know um, Bill Blair, the Pul Minister of Public Safety, the federal government, uh, helped, uh, threw some money to Nova Scotia there when they're short staff, so I'm just wondering, does that, does our budget go up because of that? Because of overtime expenses? Does somebody fill in for um, Corporal Dudley when he's not here? The RCP contract does read that they can be, move people out of our area for certain months of time. But I'll let Robert answer to that one. Oh, I know, they, but I, mean, I want the town of Stratford covered. I mean, I've been on that troop for 22 years with Glenn, and I know how it works. And I just want to know what, hopefully, that they don't have casuals here. I was just hopefully that we're, we're, our citizens of Stratford are, are getting covered. We're paying for it. I'm not sure about that part, Councillor. Uh, we'll have to follow up the RCMP to ask if have they backfilled and with who. Yeah. Um, but the contract does say that if there's, for whatever reason, they're vacant for, I forget the, I forget the time, I think it's seven days, but I'm not sure, uh, they have to replace that person. Mm -hmm. So uh, if he's gone for like two months, they definitely would have to backfill, put somebody in his position. But who that is, I don't know. We'll have to follow up on that. Okay, so we'll ask that you um, investigate and get back to us uh, either directly to Councillor uh, Gallant and also report at the next council meeting. Sure. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. Okay. Councillor oh, Smith. Any other questions? I have a question. Councillor yeah. Smith. Um, I'm noticing that several months ago we lost our month to date uh, comparison on the um, statistical report, and now mm -hmm. the year to date is. Is gone off report. I'm just wondering if that's uh, the reason for that, or I, I can't answer that question. Okay. I don't have the answer. Perhaps we can follow up on that. Uh, hopefully, yeah, it's just I'll an oversight. It's hard to compare if we don't have any any figures to compare with. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Any more questions on the numbers for the month? Okay, we'll move over to the uh, RSCP additional information. Um, we had a few collisions during the month. They're shown here. The 
speeding were nine, nine non-moving tickets were 27, moving two, insurance one, total of 39, revenue count was $7,442. Uh, and then the other statistics are just basically uh, incidents that they reported to. There's nothing outstanding for the month. So, unless there's any questions on that, we can move on. This is, the map's not there. Rick. Sorry for the questions, Derek, but the map, we usually have that map. Yeah, I, I, again, I don't know the answer to that, so someone's okay. going to have to check it. Sorry. The court will get back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Smith, just before you, you move on from the American Review report, I had uh, um, some concerns I wanted you to uh, relay. And it's in regard to our recent uh, prevalence survey. <clears throat> Not necessarily my concerns, but what would appear to be concerns from the residents. Um, if you refer to the survey, I don't know if you have access it now, but I'll, I'll, I'll highlight some of the points that I, that I highlighted here. 34% um, of the respondents in that survey expressed having only some confidence in the RCMP, um, which arguably uh, you know, could be less than a reasonable amount of confidence. Yeah. <clears throat> My argument would be that that's, uh, that confidence level has to do with our current policing model versus the individual. In, in that survey, 51% of the respondents believe in the RCMP, only 51% believe that they are approachable and easy to talk to. <clears throat> only 50% believe that the RCMP are ensuring the safety of the citizens in our area. Only 49% of those surveyed believe the RCMP are adequately enforcing the laws. <clears throat> Only 45% of those surveys believe the RCMP are treating people fairly. Only 42% believe the RCMP are supplying information to the public in a way that uh, can reduce crime. Um, and this is the, the number that, that uh, to me, stood out. <clears throat> Only 40% of the residents believe that the RCMP are promptly responding to calls. So for me, Councillor Smith, Stratford is a safe community. <clears throat> Most of the residents here, including myself, I've lived here since 1977, will never call upon the RCMP for their service, for the most part. But when they do, they want the comfort of knowing that the police will respond in a timely manner. <clears throat> I would argue that the current model of policing that we employ, the probability of the RCMP not responding in a timely manner is far too high. I had a, uh, uh, a lifelong resident named Peggy, I hope you won't provide her last name. Anyway, she reached out to me two weeks ago and Peggy, uh, Peggy called the police. There was a serious accident in front of her house. And the, the response time was 45 minutes. So when Peggy reached out to me, of course, being a lifelong resident, the first question is, I can literally see their barracks from where I live. How is it taking 45 minutes for a serious accident where there could be serious injury, <clears throat> where traffic control is necessary? My response to, to Peggy was more along the lines is that's, that's the, the, uh, service that we provide as a town. Um, we provide that service knowing, knowing that uh, the probability is high that they will not be able to respond in a timely manner. <clears throat> I also had to contact another resident, a lifelong resident named Alex. And Alex uh, discovered somebody in his home. He heard a noise and went out to his kitchen opened his garage door and there was uh, an individual inside of his garage, seemingly taking items from his garage. His girlfriend called 911. Uh, Alex, uh, and I strongly advise against this, uh, decided to grab a golf club and 
chase the culprit around the neighborhood. But Alex said to me, he said, I had some comfort in knowing that my wife had called 911 and the police would be showing up. 35 minutes later, a single officer showed up. Being a lifelong resident, Alex expected that uh, when he called 911, somebody would be there. It was 10 o'clock on Saturday night, so it wasn't 4 in the morning or 5 in the morning. So that was Alex's expectation. The reality is that at any given time, uh, there could not be a member working in Stratford at any given time. Um, the reality is that if there are, uh, that member or members could be anywhere in Queen's County. It could be in Copenhagen. It could be anywhere. And both of these people uh, were mortified to learn that. And unfortunately, people in our community learned that the hard way. They, uh, when they call upon them, which in a nice, safe community that we live in, thankfully, may not happen in your lifetime, but if it does, that's the one thing the residents of Stratford want from our police and service. If that happens, they're going to be there. The safety of, of the safety of our, of our residents uh, should be the priority of this town. If not, not one resident should have to wait 45 minutes if they call 911. But with the current policing model that we employ, that the, the probability is far too high that that will happen. So just uh, Councillor Smith, um, I'm. I'm wondering if, if uh, currently in your committee meetings and uh, what discussions that are being had regarding um, the current policing model and its effectiveness. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for your comments, all worthy and should be answered. Um, the survey, I will leave over to our expert, Lindy, who does our surveys. She can answer those questions for me. In regards to results. In regards to response times, um, I'm quite sure that these had happened. However, there are always two sides to the story. We'll have to have the RCMP in to answer these questions. I cannot speak on behalf of the RCMP, but they will be asked these questions. Um, it is not my politics really to discuss or when we're in the negotiations or discussions about policing, I, I don't like to make comment about that because there are many sides to this story, including cost, including safety, including the appearance uh, of policing within the town that have to be talked about. But I'm not comfortable talking about it in public because after all, there's many sides that we have to hear from, including the citizens and especially the the citizens of Ward 1 of which I represent. So I think your points are all well taken. They will be brought up, questions and answers, and we'll have to move forward from there. But you're right to ask these questions. Okay. Councilor Smith, the numbers that I refer to are on the website and they're from our yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, uh, I think uh, Wendy probably has a better understanding of the survey and how the questions are answered and stuff like that. Okay. Could I ask, uh, if it's okay, if I could ask, I don't want to put Wendy on the spot here. I would ask that she uh, maybe look into this and uh, provide an answer uh, for our next council meeting uh, further on the survey uh, about the questions that Councilor McDougall has raised. Do you want me to well, you can either do it now or you can do it uh, at the next council meeting. I think, okay. Yeah, well, I'm, certainly not, I'm certainly not an expert either, uh, and, and there's lots of data there, so I think what it may warrant is a further conversation for, for myself and, and Robert and Darren and probably as well to, to discuss and, and with our, um, with the company. But I mean, there's certainly when you look at, at the data that's in here, there's, um, there's a lot of there's a lot more to go into it than, than just the numbers that, that were presented tonight uh, because of the way that the ranking system is. So 
uh, let's say you have an option of, of selecting good job, average job, poor job, and don't know, don't answer. And in all of these sections, there's a large number that respond to the don't know, don't answer as well. So you actually have to interpret um, more than just just the numbers that that were stated. But we can certainly do some further some further research on on that, or you know, some uh, further discussions on this. Is there a, um, Councillor Smith, is there a, this is certainly not my um, domain, but I'm just wondering through the conversation, is there like metrics measured um, by the RCMP on response times? So is there somewhere in a report where it has how many calls or 911 calls or accident, whatever, calls this month and then like a response time for each one? I would think that that would be a metric that they would measure. Yeah, I, know, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing that it probably is. But is that Everything. public information or shared? I, I don't know, but that might be. Everything is confidential. And every police vehicle has a GPS, so you're you're going to get your answer. You look at that GPS. Maybe I could ask uh, I could ask Councilor Smith to uh, discuss that with the RCMP to see if there is a, a a way of reporting on average response times for calls, if that's possible. That might be an answer. Oh, well, liars, uh, I, I mean, it seems like we're hide, trying to hide stuff here. Did I get that feeling? Like, no, it's good. No, well, I just, uh, like, Councillor McDougall is looking at these numbers and telling the right numbers, and all of a sudden, like, just going around here. Like, you know, the RCMP work for the town of Stratford. We hire them. We want to know the answers. But you also have to realize the RCMP are investigating every complaint that comes in. Now, some of them are fairly serious. And because they're an investigation and there are people involved, and that's their job. And I'm not comfortable with getting names and addresses and stuff. Well, we're not a couple of people, like Councilman Dougal, like 45 minutes late for a 911 call. Yeah. No, no, yes, no. that's our CMP. Yes. That, that, that's the question. I'm going to ask you a question later, Mr. Smith. I'll put you on the table. Do we have 24 hour policing? I would say, I can't answer that question. Because if I answer do that, do we have a car in the area right now in Stratford? I would have an area. We don't know that. No. That's, that's disappointing. Okay. But what's, what's the residence? So my wife at home, unsafe? Steve's wife, Darren's wife, Gary, something happens? Home invasion? Where are they at? This is why we need. This is why we need the different model. We need the model like Newfoundland, the RNC model. Well, then, well, Cornerbrook and St. Johnson, because we need 24-hour policing. Councilor Glenn, um, Councilor Smith, uh, as chair of safety services, gave us a report. And if there's a question, I think it's, it's appropriate to ask a question. And I appreciate the comments. Yeah. It, but I think it's only fair that if you have a question, that it be allowed to be followed up and answered. So yeah. um, you are permitted to ask questions, and I, I welcome them, but okay. if you wouldn't mind just forming it in the form of a question so that we can, uh, we can answer, we can provide an answer and, and, uh, and go on from there. Now, so Derek, I'm gonna ask you a question, Councilor Glenn, and this is one of my mandates of being a counselor for the residents, and you guys all know it, to have a car 24 hours to Stratford at all times. Do we have a car every year tonight? I can't answer that question. Okay. Because I'm, I'm not an RCP officer, nor am I in touch with the RCP right now. Having said that, we have two tails here. Pre-detachment in Stratford and after. Now, our response time when the RCP officers were working out of May Point Plaza was quite limited. There was no doubt about that because they were in May Point. Now that they're in Stratford, I think the response times have improved. How much have they improved? I don't know. I can ask that question. But from what I'm personally feeling, I see more police cars now within Stratford than I did before. However, that's observation. What we're looking for here is cold hard facts. And we'll check into that later. Can you give me that answer? My mandate as a counselor right now, um, and this year or two years or three years, is ASAP. My mandate is to have a car in the area in 24 hours. Now, if you ask, you, you ask the chair of policing service in Charlottetown, there's a car in the area all the time? Yes. 
You asked Summerside? Yes. You asked um, Kenzie? Yes. I'm asking you tonight, and we don't know. That's correct. Okay, so there's an answer. There's a question been asked, and uh, I'll ask a question. Yeah, that answer be provided uh, uh, directly to you and also reported on to the next council meeting. Okay? Thank you, Richard. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, please. Okay. Would you follow that up, Robert, with the uh, RCMP and uh, make sure that we have an answer to that on the question about 24 hour policing? Or unless you want to. I can answer now if you wish. Okay. <laughs> um, our Stratford RCMP participate with Queens Region to have one person on duty for all of Queens, and our Stratford member is part of that duty. So it could be anywhere in Queens, but there's always one member in a car, and our member is on that rotation. We have the level of service that we pay for. This is a choice that we made. And council has a choice to make whenever, at whatever time they want for a level of service. But it's not that the RCMP aren't providing that; it's that we're not paying for it. But that's only between the hours of two and six, isn't it? That they well, uh, <laughs> that was the way it was with the previous. Uh, in policing world, they don't like to talk about uh, how many members are available at what time because the bad guys also watch. Oh, TV. Yes, right. <laughs> sorry, I, uh, strike that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. But only during certain hours. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Okay, we have a lot more important business to know. Oh, do you have some, a comment? No, uh, I just wanted to, to reiterate my comments were, were what Robert said. That I, I agree, that is that's the model that we paid for. And that's what we get. And I, and I agree, and that's uh, why this discussion is, is important. Yeah, and I think to, uh, I'll just uh, say this and, and then maybe we can move on to the business. We do have a, a request that will be going forward for uh, looking at the best policing option for, for Stratford uh, for the police development to give us a, a recommendation on that. Uh, and then council will be asked to uh, make a decision based on cost and based on other factors uh, that, that will be uh, as part of that study. So uh, that will be uh, moving forward uh, in the near future. Okay, let's move on to uh, other business. We have a lot more important business to cover tonight. So could I ask uh, that you provide uh, the transit report? Okay, uh, the Humane Society is in there. It's pretty standardized for the month. There's nothing to understand in the Humane Society. And if you wish, we can move on from that one. Uh, next will be the transit report. Uh, the numbers keep on going up. They're nowhere near the numbers that we used to have, but they are going up. Uh, I'd like to mention that the provincial government has bought new electric school buses that are going to be also used in the transit system, like uh, in the outlining communities. Uh, this will give us a good indication about electric buses for the future, whether they're affordable and provide the necessary service that we have. So that is being watched. Any questions on transit that we have tonight? Would you give me an update on more than three transit? I can say ditto from last month, but no. It's basically the same as last month. Right, thank it's, you. Being, it's being worked on. You have not been forgotten. Thank you. Just want it in there for the record. Okay. Uh, Crossroads Fire Department. Uh, again, as I previously mentioned in safety services, my Crossroads Fire com uh, Committee is seeing changeover in their uh, town of Stratford representation. I'd like to thank the uh, people who have served and will be serving and move to another committee for their service. In regards to the fire, it's pretty standardized. If you notice on the bottom of your sheet, uh, there was a TCH vehicle fire uh, that is mentioned this month. Uh, the reason that it was mentioned was that it was near a sensitive site, uh, the water area. So the foam had to be put on the vehicle to put the fire out because the gas tank was on fire. And it's mentioned because of the water supply to the towns in the area environment was uh, contacted. Um, it's also noted that uh, on the night of this fire, they were at the fire department in training. So the call, call was very quick. I also understand that our mayor fulfilled a lifelong wish and became part of 
part of the traffic uh, control area one night for a vehicle accident. Job well done. A couple nights ago. Yeah. Uh, other than that, the uh, fire department is pretty regular again, as per se. Yeah, it's quite impressive uh, that uh, I won't take long. I just uh, was at the intersection of Strasburg, or the uh, Trans Canada Highway and Kenmont Road, and there was a high speed impact at the uh, at the intersection just as we were turning right. I just have to look over and there was just like an explosion. And uh, I looked at my watch. Uh, the fire department were there within seven minutes, and the RCMP were there within eight and a half minutes. So uh, it was. You know, it was well handled, uh, everybody there. There was a paramedic uh, who stepped forward from one of the vehicles and took care of the two drivers. Uh, it, was a, it was a miracle that somebody wasn't killed, but uh, it was just a matter of, uh, I'm not sure what the cause was, but it was, um, it was a very near thing for a couple of, a couple of people. So it's a very uh, sobering moment, I guess you might say. Very, uh, something that really makes you sit up and take notice, that's for sure. I really admire the work that the uh, volunteer fire department do because uh, they took control of the, the traffic and there was major traffic there and they took control and uh, it was uh, it was really well handled. Sorry, sorry. Thank you for your service. That is my report. If no other questions. Just uh, one, well, it's not a question, it's just a remark. They're planting beautiful trees around the fire hall now. I, I've watched them there in the last few days. Uh, on the perimeter of the property, and it's going to be nice uh, next spring. Okay, thanks for your report, Congressman Smith. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to recreation, culture, and events. Uh, let's get Chair of that Committee, uh, Councilor uh, Steve Milan, to uh, give his yeah. report. Thank you, Richard. Um, recreation, culture, events committee. A Zoom meeting was held on October 22nd. Just uh, reports in front of your, everyone. Agenda items included a land donation policy, park planning for TL, Pondside, Cotton, Fulton's Parks, and uh, updates on capital projects related to the Recreation and Culture Events Department, the Waterfront Park, Community Campus, and Fulton's Multi Use Building and National Playground. Um, arts and Culture, um, the highly anticipated 2019 2020 interactive public art piece, The Red Wing Blackbird, will be installed at Fulton's Park by the end of November. Um, their artwork will be in the National Playground that will be installed in the 148, 148 Conservation Park. Um, also note on arts and culture, um, I want to thank all my committee members. I know I'm losing a couple of ladies there that were, did uh, several terms, um, several terms with us. Uh, Bernadette Milner was going to finance, and I want to thank Bernadette tonight. And uh, just, just Lane O'Hanley, who took a number of terms in with uh, arts and culture. and. Uh, uh, she just, uh, she's a great asset to our community. Um, also this month we have a meeting uh, scheduled with the Committee of a Whole for a 20 minute meeting. We're gonna look at our visions and mission and objectives and, and strategies and actions uh, for our community. Uh, just Lane O'Hanley is gonna lead the presentation and uh, Mark uh, Soderfard for a, a creative PEI is gonna be there too doing a PowerPoint presentation. And this, this, just talking about the value of public art in the community yeah. and what's especially with the waterfront coming up and the community campus, uh, some big pieces there. So it'll be a good presentation. Uh, we work hard, we have special, we have special couple of meetings, not even scheduled, and uh, we're trying to make a, a great presentation to our next uh, committee of hold in November there, late November. I know Upland didn't meet with us, so maybe they're too busy I, with the arts and culture. I think they were caught up, but uh, uh, and the survey, I don't know, there's nothing, is there anything in the survey about arts? Like, I, I couldn't find anything. Wendy, is there anything in, about arts in the community? Be something to look at down the road. You know, it's like, uh, is there anything under arts and culture? I, there's nothing off the top of my head. There's an annual question, there may be an alternating year question, but um, again, I don't recall one off the top of my head. But if not, we'll, we'll be having a call here in the next uh, couple of weeks to look for questions. So if there's specific topic areas that you want to submit for consideration this year that would give you the information that you're looking for, yes, then I, let us know. You know yep. It's a, it's very important with community growing and you know whether art and a lot of people want to have some input there. So yeah, yeah it just depends on what we have to ask. Like we have to have a very topical yes. piece that we can ask. It's not just a general 
comment kind of yes, know, piece, yeah. but yeah, if you have something very specific that we can uh, turn into a question. We'll be like I know the RFPs now are 15,000. We're, 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 you know, we're looking at something, I mean, the, the town, the way the town's grown, we're looking at something, you know, bigger than that, you know what I mean? Like Charlottetown is something you know, different, made believe and so on, the numbers and so on. Just looking at the, get everybody's input. Did we not pass, a, we passed a policy uh, when, I think since we've been on, since I've been on, yes. on a 1% uh, earned yes. expenditure, uh, I forget how that was, but for, say for community campus, the amount of dollars we spent on okay. that campus municipally into That'll our, in, will, there's like a 1% allocation of that. Robert, I could be wrong, but. No, that's um, true. So I think we do that, and then the fifteen thousand dollars a year I think is pretty good with the budgets that we run right now. Um, like I, I'm a big advocate for yeah. uh, making our surroundings more interesting and and uh, art, but I think that we'll see a big difference with that one percent. I think that that will be, I think that'll be good, um, and then paired with the fifteen thousand year annual, I think that that's. Probably pretty good. We just haven't seen the benefits of that one percent yet because no. we haven't rate. Right? That's right. Yet. Yeah. That's where so we're at. Exactly. That'll be that'll be a that'll be big. Yeah. I'd just like to add that that one percent was capped out at a It maximum. was capped at fifty thousand, I think. Yeah. 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 You're right, Jared. Yeah. Yeah. Time good for discussion around the table, video hall, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's good. And uh, just move down the Stratford Youth and Center Council. The Youth Center currently has 55 members. Uh, we're near c capacity of 60. Last last month we had 48, so it's improving every month. Um, Spooktoberfest was a big success. Um, I think the mayor Alton attended, yes. And uh, yeah, and Gary, and uh, I want to thank you guys for showing up. Councillors and uh, the home decoration contest had eight entries, the pumpkin contest had 19 entries, and the costume contest had five entries. There were approximately 200 cars through the tr uh, through the truck or tree drive through, and the youth volunteers gave out over 400 treat bags. Ran over well. The weather was good, and uh, youth council leadership committee organized events and collected over $600 at the end of the gate. There, people just giving donations. It was really nice, and. Uh, and just move down there, Stratford programs are continuing. Um, the Youth Council has the, the walkathon in November as part of the continued fundraising concerns process. I mean, Youth Center and Youth Council will be selling raffle tickets starting mid November for a $500 gift card from Sophie's. Money from the raffle and the walkathon will be going to towards Youth Council Christmas projects. We plan on once again sponsoring some kids for Christmas and putting together a care package for the homeless and PI. This is the third year for the, these projects. So, so. And the facilities are still up to date, the events, and uh, as that's, uh, unfortunately, the town's travel was, was unable to host Remembrance Day ceremony. This year, the town rebroadcasted the 2018 ceremony in lieu of the line event. Uh, special thanks to Tanya Craig, program Quarter, coordinator, for creating and organizing the Remembrance Day video, and our mayor and council for their presentations. The new video was created to showcase the 43 veterans' banners put on display annually in the town, town center. The council provided the audio by reading in planner's fields the act of remembrance at Churchill's speech. The town takes great pride in remembering and recognizing our residents who served our country so honorably. The Remember Day display in the town center lobby is a visibly striking arrangement that is well appreciate, appreciated. Two new veteran banners will be ordered for November 2021. And that's my report, Your Worship. Thank you for your report. Any questions on uh, Council Lyons' report? Yeah, just a uh, question, commentary. Um, I think this is going to be my thing. Uh, Deputy Mayor's, Deputy Mayor Close thing is transit in 4-3. Mine's a, a, a rink in Stratford. I, uh, I'm reminded every time I come to the meetings after uh, practice in Georgetown, practice in Belfast, practice in Montague, uh, of that inability to get ice in, in Pommel. It reminds me every week uh, how much we need a rink here in Stratford. It's uh, almost dire, I would say. Um, so I just want to uh, uh, present that. It would likely be my thing, but uh, it's, it's so needed. So I, I hope that 
at some point we can uh, start really grinding it out here and get some the wheels in motion for that. You certainly have my full support on that. Uh, I know that we will be asking that question to residents uh, in the near future on our uh, consultation uh, along with the forecast uh, financial uh, consultation uh, with regard to uh, different options for uh, different expenditures and what it means in terms of, of taxes. And it will be really, uh, I'm really eager to see the results of that. And I hope, uh, I hope there will be support for it, for it and that we're able to uh, find a way to, uh, to make that happen. Within, within reasonable budgetary constraints, obviously. For sure. There certainly is a huge demand. Councillor uh, Gallant, uh, I presented uh, Art and Culture in Tanya Craig with a painting that was uh, presented to me to, to take to your meeting to, the, to decide where that painting might hang in the town of Stratford. Yes. Was that discussed at yes, the meeting? Yes, it's going to be in, I guess, be in the lobby of town of Stratford. Well, thank you very yep. much. I'll, I'll tell uh, the owner of that painting that it's there and that they can come visit. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for arranging that, Councillor Flo. Deputy Mayor Flo. I wonder if Jeremy, do you want to say a couple words on the nest, the need for the rink as a uh, recreation director and our sports fields and so on? Yeah, I'll always be an advocate for uh, for sports and recreation. Um, so wildly important for our kids, uh, young adults, adults, seniors. Um, in regards to the rink, yes, I concur with uh, Councillor McDougall that our kids are playing in Pommel. Um, um, hockey, ring at, whatever the uh, on-ice sport is. Um, but they are also traveling to Georgetown, uh, to Belfast. They're going as far as Montague and Murray River. Uh, to get extra ice time that we just can't get here in Stratford, nor can you get in the capital areas in Charlottetown. Um, in regards to our sport fields, our soccer programs are, um, are uh, I won't say capacity, but they're up there in terms of maximizing the field use in the evenings and weekends. Uh, and baseball and softball have both been growing over the last few years, so uh, they're looking for additional uh, fields. I know some of their programs are operating as far away as Cardigan. Um, so I think uh, with community campus planning, we should be looking at all our sports, all our venues, and see how we can maximize and uh, maximize everything for all our sports and all our residents. Thank you. Uh, I have one question, Jeremy. In regards to the rink, um, which way are we leaning? Are we, are we thinking about building our own rink, or is in the island gymnastics? Renting out land, leasing land, and letting another organization build a rink uh, for the cost factor of it. Do we have? No, we haven't. We haven't had those discussions yet. We're not that far along, right? Okay, now. thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I, I think uh, we, we require a special committee for this. I think we should put that in progress and. Uh, could we ask that be um, added to the next community, the whole uh, agenda? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, any other uh, comments or questions on the uh, recreation report? Not thank you for your report. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, I'll ask uh, Councillor Gail McDonald, the Chair of Finance and Technology, uh, for her report. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so the reports are in your package. I'll go over a few things that the uh, department has been doing uh, the past month. Uh, the financial statements for uh, March 31st, 2020 have been circulated to Council, the province, and are available on our town website as well. Uh, work is uh, currently being done on the Safe Restart Program for funding for COVID-related expenditures. Uh, that's from the federal government. Uh, staff is currently working on updating the budget documents for the uh, 2019-2020 actual numbers. Our October utility billing is being processed. Uh, the due date on the bills is uh, tomorrow, November 13th. Disconnect notices for overdue accounts will be going out uh, before December 1st. We're uh, currently working on a tender for a unified communication phone system, and we're also working on a tender for financing of the Pipe to Charlottetown sewer project. We're also working on uh, computer tenders at this time. 
staff attended an asset management virtual conference, and they also participated in town suite training sessions. Um, they're also working on the asset management inventory to prepare for the introduction of town suite asset management module. So this is my report, uh, Your Worship. Also the uh, report from our last uh, committee meeting, which was held October 20th, is also uh, repackaged. If anyone has any questions about those two reports, myself or the Director of Finance will be able to answer. Any questions on, on the report? I have a question, and um, um, Councillor, but I don't, it's, it might span a couple, and it just popped in my head while you were going through was the financing of the pipe. Um, and it doesn't necessarily speak to that, but um, I'm interested in, and maybe Mayor it came up in your meeting, um, the rates, the rates that we're going to pay Charlottetown. Um, so we have contracted rates, right, right now, and and they go to the next four years. The next four, ending in so 2024. So it's originally a six-year, six-year plan. Yeah, we're a year and a half in. We're a year and a half in. And so, and, and maybe in your discussion, Mayor, um, so is there gonna be a, like a, this is kind of like a regional type scenario now, so are we gonna have someone, when they go to redo those rates in 2023 or 2024, we're gonna have someone at the table to help with that discussion? I have had discussions <laughs> with uh, Mayor Brown about setting up a regional utility where we would have a, a seat at the table or a representation based on the amount of our flow or on a per capita basis or whatever would be appropriate. But uh, uh, really we need to have some form of with, with oversight from another another body, uh, either provincial or uh, a Crown, Crown Corporation to uh, to really make sure that we, uh, we're we not at the mercy of you know whatever the situation is at the time. Yeah, Anyways, that's what I worry about somewhat, but yeah, I was just wondering what if that looks like. And then just to clarify, the agreement sets the, the way that Charlton will charge us for the sewer. Yeah. Um, but they've guaranteed it won't exceed a certain rate for that first six year period. But the amount is set for the agreement. So if nothing changes, um, it determines how much we'll pay. Okay. It's just not capped the way it is for the first six years. And that's why His Worship has been trying to get you know, a regional utility set up so that we own jointly with Charlotte on that sewer treatment plant and possibly with Cornwall as well. Yeah, and, and I did okay. get a favorable response from uh, Mayor Charlottetown and uh, uh, I think uh, we need to go in with our eyes open though because with the you know, seat at the table and ownership also comes liability. So uh, if there are other costs, then we would be on hook for those. So we really need to be cognizant of all, you know, looking at it from all perspectives and make sure that we're not uh, we're taking the best approach for the residents. Yeah, thanks. It just popped into my head while we were talking about that because that is definitely something we should be thinking about. So we can, yeah, yeah. Well, is it fair, fair to say that we're not at the table now? I don't I, think we're at the table. We're, we're having discussions with We're a customer of Charlottetown. Right that's now. right. We're a customer. <coughs> we're not at the table. Like we're, on, we're on a meter. We pay yeah. on the basis of our flow and uh, with plus 15%. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Sorry, the, so then we have the four years and the six years. So this this contract that we're in goes to what year? Well, it's four and a half years from now, so it's twenty year twenty. Okay. 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 Sorry. Please. I hope that's right. Uh, so also the financial statements are in your package. Uh, revenue is down uh, five point six percent. Our revenue is uh, up by 3.8% and our expenses are down uh, below the 10%. So a lot of those uh, can, COVID can be uh, the reason sort of things, uh, especially with, uh, with both actually their revenues and their expenses. Uh, while I have the floor, Your Worship, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, my Finance and Technology Committee for their 2018-2020 uh, commitment to the town. Uh, several of them are coming back, 
So we'll get a couple new faces around the table and the names will be released uh, later on this evening. Yeah, thank you. That's my report, your question. Thanks for your report. Okay, um, we'll now move on to planning, development, and heritage. Uh, I'll ask uh, the chair of the committee, Councillor Bill Burgess, to give her report. All right, I'll um, go through um, uh, what we talked about at our last meeting. Um, we had a um, discussion on uh, development or forest trails development. Um, there was some removal of trees out there, so we're just going through a bit of a reconfiguration to figure out what we can do to remedy that with the landowner. Um, also, um, Blaine is, our town planner, is working through the official plan review. So he's uh, working his way through that. He presented a uh, planning board with what's he, what he has um, gone through to this point. He's worked internally with town staff to bring up a few changes here and there with an official plan. Um, this will be something that we'll all get to review at some point. He's in initial stages. Um, and then we also discussed um, looking at reviewing that uh, rezoning piece, the rezoning um, public consultation piece. So we're looking to improve that. Um, um, internally, the town has, the planner is reaching out with uh, planning um, colleagues throughout the area to see what innovative um, approaches other places may be taken in that to kind of reduce a bit of the conflict between the residents and the landowner and, and maybe there's better ways of presenting information um, to the residents um, that will make the process I think a little um, uh, bring a little take a little conflict out of there um, so we're working on that um, and we'll meet with developers on that as well um, last but not least, we did discuss the waterfront development um, as a board um, that's going on right now and the public consultation piece. We did discuss um, a waterfront, a w last waterfront residential piece that sits right on the water facing Charlottetown. It's a beautiful piece of property at the end of Shepherd Drive. Um, and, you know, what we would ideally like to see in that piece and um, whether we would like to work with CABC to try to make that bottom floor more of a public piece or, or um, commercial piece, whatever it may be. But um, so we kind of discussed that and threw a few ideas around the table with regards to that piece of land. Um, and uh, I believe you met with CABC and kind of passed on those thoughts. Um, so I think that's a good move. Um, other than that, that's kind of my report and what we discussed. If there's any questions on that, I'll take them. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. The, uh, I understand that we lost a employee out of the planning department, and a new position is, has been advertised. Yes. Uh, what kind of response have you had to that? Do you know, or I'll still like under? There's about 19 applications, I believe. 19 okay. applications. Yeah, yeah. And I also understand one of your staff members lost his mother uh, through illness, so I just want to pass on my condolences to Blaine. Thank you. My only comment would be uh, with regard to the numbers of development survey uh, from October 1st to October 30, 2020, compared to 2019 for the same period. Uh, looks like we're, we're up significantly, almost double in single family, so Yeah, absolutely. October was a good month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we are catching up in terms of the year. I know we're not going to catch up by the end of the year, but we're certainly respectable in terms of the year to date. Absolutely. I, I mean, Kevin's got the a lot of the day to day there, and he knows. But yeah, we're absolutely sitting pretty good this year. Um, we're we're yeah, on budget if not over a little bit. I think we had a good year with COVID coming into play. We weren't sure where we we're going to stand, but we're sitting good. Want to say that the uh, uh, Stratford Honor Roll project out here at the Cenotaph, it, it's, it's, it's really a great job, well done. And, and I think once we get the boots on there, it's even going to be upgraded again. So 
It's too bad we didn't have our ceremony this year, but uh, that's a great, great piece of work up there. Yeah. It, is, uh, it is beautiful, it is, and yeah. it was a beautiful day, too. Yeah. <laughs> we missed out on that. Um, we missed day. out on that. Um, but uh, I have to give kudos to Kevin and the Heritage yeah. team there. They, um, they went out and found some funding through Veterans Affairs, $25,000 for Veterans Affairs, and they worked with us on that. So yeah. um, kudos work. to them. Good work. Yeah, yeah great job. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for your Thanks. report. <clears throat> okay, we'll now move on to infrastructure, and I'll ask uh, Deputy Mayor Klo for his uh, report. Thank you, Your Worship. The minutes uh, of our Zoom October 19th meeting are in your package, and also the report that I'll be presenting you is also there for today's meeting. The waterfront treatment uh, plant, uh, the system continues to function well. We are currently in the process of preparing a, a plan for the final sludge removal uh, program in preparation for the decommissioning of the system. The wastewater collection system to Charlottetown, the contractor is finishing the testing of the four main under the bridge and completing the connection in order to begin commissioning by mid-month November. There are a few items to complete inside the pump station before commissioning as well, but the contractor is still on target to have the system opening by the end of November. So that's, that's good news. Inflow infiltration reduction strat strategy, KWA Construction has been awarded the contract for manhole repairs and is currently completing the work, monitoring and review of the sewer system to identify areas requiring repairs. Investing in Canada infrastructure programs, sewer lift station upgrades, coals are working on design with anticipation to construct in the spring of 2021. The water station upgrade, the project is out for tender and is closing in on November 9th, so it's already closed. Uh, we will have a better idea of construction schedule after the tenders are received, so I believe we got a, a couple of uh, tenders on that. The Provincial Act of Tration, uh, Provincial Active Transportation Fund, Island Coastal Services are progressing well on the Georgetown Road projects and appears to be on target for completion by the 1st of December. I drove by there today and they're pretty well down to the bottom and just getting ready to pave that. And it's a great addition to it and we'll finish the Georgetown Road. Fuller's washroom facilities, the contractor is scheduling to do a final cleaning of the facility and, and once complete they will open the, the building uh, to the public. Uh, the natural playground construction is expected to begin later this month. And in addition, uh, the staff are preparing for the Christmas decorations, installation throughout the, the town. Interior renovations, repairs, and maintenance to our building has been ongoing. Uh, decommissioning seasonal buildings and equipment for the winter months. Speed humps are being removed as, as we speak. Uh, trail grooming and maintenance throughout the town is ongoing. Sports fields, maintenance is ongoing. Staff is in full preparation. Is in full preparation for the upcoming winter season, preparing for equipment and collecting salt and material for treating surfaces and sidewalks. The annual sewer flushing jetting is complete. Sewer lift stations maintenance continue and should be completed by the end of the month. And there was no uh, during the month of October, there was no major issues uh, with our water distribution or, or wastewater collection system. And also, I want to thank uh, the committee members for planning and active transportation for over the past two years. A lot of the uh, members are returning and some are moving on to other committees. So I want to thank them for their attendance and uh, participation over the last couple of years on, on the committees. So that's my report to Open to questions. Myself or Director Jeremy, I'm sure will answer. Any questions? Uh, I just like the one one statement, and I know this is not part of the town, but the Hillsborough Bridge and the Active Transportation Trail coming across. Uh, I think the citizens in the surrounding area have gone across that bridge in the morning and come back in the afternoon. It's well maintained and well paced. Uh, it's really nice to see people getting across that bridge without too much backup. Great job. It's going to be interesting to see how it all unfolds. I'm still trying to imagine what they're doing there every day. 
go by, I keep saying, what are they doing here? But you know, exactly. I know it's all good, so. Can you describe exactly what they're, because I'm sure everyone driving over that bridge yeah. is trying to figure out exactly what yeah. that's going to, I know I do, every time I, I go do too. We, I don't think there was a, a drawing or a plan we resolved. There. We do have a set of drawings that we reviewed, and uh, it's going to be very similar to what you've seen in Cornwall, um, with the, uh, the type of uh, the guardrail that they have there, uh, the width of the path, they are removing the sections of the, of the concrete um, barrier uh, on the uh, bridge and then they'll widen that sidewalk uh, to a 10-foot uh, wide path for, for cyclists and pedestrians. So it'll all come together once, uh, once you uh, do see it. So are they, are they actually, because they removed the rail, so are they doing a new rail that pushes it out a little bit more? or? There'll be a new rail, but there was about uh, 12 inches of concrete uh, that was a, that a, was a barrier that yeah. was there. That will be removed. We'll okay. give you some extra space. And, yeah. and then the, uh, from what the plans show, the uh, the actual railing will be outside of that. So that'll give you a little extra distance. And uh, it'll be a, a whole new rail across the bridge, which is, which is a different style than what will be on the actual approaches. But uh, the approaches will be very similar to what you see in Cornwall. Okay, I haven't been out in Cornwall. So there's going to be a guardrail in between traffic and the active transportation lane. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. interesting. I'll take yeah. that out. It's going to be a game changer, really, uh, when it's up and running. Yeah. And then also, while uh, Jeremy, while you're there, you could give us, uh, I noticed uh, the other day that there's uh, bicycle lanes on Mount Herbert Road on both sides. Yeah, uh, the, the Trans Canada Trail is being constructed along there, and, and they are putting uh, bike lanes. We don't have a lot of information on that project. We've asked for uh, a little bit more additional information, and I know Trout is working with them to get that information, but uh, we don't have that as of yet. But yes, they are putting some active transportation along that section. And uh, the uh, Trans Canada Trail is supposed to connect through to our existing trail in Fullerton's. So that'll be and we're also moving the park along the way, am I right? Yeah, that? that's correct. Yeah. So I was surprised to see that. Uh, Someone mentioned that they could drive over on both sides if they widened it for bicycle walk-on lanes. So it's quite nice, really. Yeah, they're doing a lot of uh, bike lane widening all throughout the province. Yeah. A lot of paving. Uh, you, know, you can travel through uh, a lot of different areas throughout the province. They've done a lot of work to widen uh, as part of their active transportation yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah, it's worth the ride over. Yeah. Now, so Jeremy, I'd say a great job you did this summer with the speed bumps. I know we. We talked a lot, and a lot of counselors and the residents all over. Great job, and and uh, stick handling around that for the summer and keep everyone safe. Okay, great, nice. great work. We'll be uh, we'll be having discussions at budget time about whether we're going to put some uh, permanent ones in or, or buy some more. So. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we we'll now move on to committee of the whole. We had a uh, committee of the whole meeting. Uh, November 5th, um, and we talked about um, two items on the agenda were sustainability, and I didn't get the other one. Robert, do you recall what was the other item? We had a briefing on sustainability. Website. Website. website and sustainability. We both had a good discussion, good presentation on those. Uh, as well, we talked about uh, the waterfront uh, possibility uh, uh, of property CABC. Questions on committee as a whole? If not, we'll um, move to sustainability. We ask the chair of that committee, uh, Councilor Darren McDougall, to uh, give his report. Thank you, Your Worship. Perhaps I'll just start uh, uh, by reminding the public there that uh, the mayor and I are participating in the November campaign. <laughs> may not be able to see anything from there. <laughs> perhaps, I, perhaps, Gary, I could use some of your just for men or something. I like it. Very much. <laughs> anyway, just a friendly reminder, uh, if anybody would like to donate and support our big stashes, it would be appreciated. It's a great cause. It's a great cause. I should have started growing it the last year. <laughs> Yeah, you're not much better. No. <laughs> I'll see through. <laughs> but a good cause nonetheless, and, and uh, anybody take the time, and, uh, whether it's us or somebody else, but uh, support that good cause. 
Um, yeah. The minutes uh, for our meeting are in your package. Uh, I'll highlight, highlight a few things. Um, uh, the draft base bylaw. Uh, it was drafted uh, on the assumption that the province was going to insert a new section, 182.2, 182.1, and which they had circulated for comment. Uh, the preamble of, of this section it specifically referred to energy efficiency, renewable energy, water supply, storage use, <coughs> conservation, and, uh, and that is what was at the beginning of bylaw. Uh, Province deleted the proposed section 182 of the Act, and it no longer gives a list of things uh, the town can do. Um, so Robert suggested that we just limit it to energy efficiency, renewable energy, and water conservation. Um, Robert noted that uh, we don't have any plans for water conservation now, uh, but we might in the future. Um, just for the benefit of, of those watching on Facebook. Robert, did you want to speak about our PACE program? Sure, PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy, and essentially um, what it is is residents would borrow against their assessed value of the property to put in an energy efficiency or renewable energy or water conservation um, appliance or upgrade of some kind and pay it back over time, and if it's not paid, it becomes a lien on the property, similar to a water and sewer bill. So it's uh, in, in jurisdictions where they've used it. Um, they also access provincial grants, but they have uh, seen a significant uptake on, on in the, even accessing provincial grants in those communities. So. Thank you. Uh, Robert, just to, uh, sorry, uh, I was gonna ask another question. Oh, he's, okay, he's, okay, go ahead. Okay, I just didn't want to interrupt council to do that before, that's all. The PACE program is for everybody in the community, including businesses? That's that's uh, for council to decide, but yes, that's kind of the- And we're looking at idea. solar and heat pumps? It can be solar, it can be heat pumps, it can be insulation, anything that reduces their greenhouse okay. gas emissions, essentially. And basically, they, they get the money up front. The high cost of installing would be paced over the, the life of the, the loan kind of thing, is it? Yes, and the idea is that you wouldn't pay any more out uh, on the debt than what your savings and energy would be. So okay, it would so be revenue done. neutral or better. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, and, then, and then at some point, it's no longer revenue neutral. It's, uh, it's a significant saving, yeah. Uh, and that could be within a 10-year you know, period. <clears throat> I know. I noticed just on, on that topic, uh, is being around the building world a bit, there's solar is becoming quite popular. Sunway is a big company that's busy in this. Yeah, uh, but it is becoming uh, quite popular. Uh, moving on, um, we uh, discussed the uh, provincial uh, climate climate uh, challenge program. Uh, the province launched a climate challenge program and individual municipalities and other groups can apply for a project up to $100,000. And Maddie identified a number of potential projects for the committee to review, uh, such as the Kelly, Kelly's Pond restoration, uh, which a lot of residents in that area would suggest is long overdue. Um, an urban tree planting program, and she also included the solar retrofit for our, our town building. Uh, charging stations, because we know now that this is something we may be doing uh, with Maritime Electric. Um, Maddie's a real asset uh, to, to this committee and, and the town in regard to these types of projects that we're launching. And uh, um, hats off to G. Robert for identifying the, that position and, and uh, the need here in our community. And she's really working out well. Um, we, uh, moving on, we uh, discussed the annual business survey. Uh, we've long been discussing how to engage the business community. This is ongoing. Uh, they recently come up with uh, ideas, and, and Wendy is the leader on this front. 
the resident survey is, was well received and very helpful in soliciting input uh, on potential town priorities and projects. Um, we get excellent feedback from the resident survey and uh, we could hire a consultant uh, to do a business survey every year. We've had that discussion. We had that discussion uh, uh, in council here as well. Um, Wendy felt, uh, however, that the professional survey uh, was a good idea, but not an in-depth uh, survey as the resident uh, survey, just perhaps to have something online. Um, so we had more discussion about that. Um, then we, uh, moving on to the business uh, and engagement manager report. Um, again, Wendy, uh, uh, the virtual coffee chat that was held, she had a discussion about what went on there. Um, so the, some of the topics were businesses uh, collaborating with each other or with the town uh, to run some events. Uh, and then Maddie made a presentation uh, regarding her report. Um, Maddie noted that uh, we'll be welcoming the climate sense into turn in January 2021 and uh, are working on, on scoping the climate change adaption program that they'll complete over the, uh, the next six months. Uh, Maddie noted that we have a grant from the federal government of $50,000 to address uh, erosion and sediment runoff from construction sites. Uh, that will certainly be put to good use. It's, a, it's something that comes up uh, regularly. Uh, and the grant has already allowed us to maintain uh, collaboration with the provincial department of transportation and infrastructure and energy throughout uh, 2020. That's uh, my report, your worship. Thank you. Any questions on the report? Do you think uh, this question an economic developer officer for the town? Like I know we it's, we're growing. Um, we have the gray group, um, the building being constructed out here as we speak. Mark McDonald and uh, of course Home Harbor is opening next weekend, and uh, of course that whole facility across the street there is full now. And uh, with the way the town is growing, what do you what do you think yourself? So we do have that discussion. Um, uh, you know, there's a committee member on sustainability who, who felt it wasn't the, the lane that he was should be in. He was a business person, and uh, you know, he was of the opinion that the, the two should separate. And so we've been having discussions about that. Um, so there, yeah, there's lots of ideas being thrown around. Perhaps uh, CAO Robert, he just wants to you know, speak briefly on that. Sorry, was it was it should we have an economic development officer or committee? Was your question? I was just uh, maybe down, well, probably committee then an officer. I mean, uh, you know, just a town, the town grower in the, in the future. Yeah. With all the, the business coming across the bridge here now. We did, um, when we uh, hired Jay a couple of years ago, we repurposed Wendy's job description. So she's actually our business and engagement manager. So part of her duties now are our economic development. We may at some point need it full time, but we decided to kind of take one step and, you know, make it a, like a half time position. Uh, so we do have some uh, resources now on that. The Economic Development Committee is a different discussion. Thank you. We, we, I, I did have a brief discussion with uh, Council McDougal before the meeting today about uh, some ideas um, that we may want to explore, and we'll be discussing them both with uh, Wendy and Robert, uh, and then bring them forward, hopefully, uh, with regard to more focus on the environment, more focus on um, business community, uniquely, uh, but also through the Sustainability Committee. But uh, we will be having discussions about that, and I'd like to get uh, CAO Robert Hughes' views on that, as well as uh, our business engagement uh, person, uh, manager, uh, Wendy, Wendy Watts, input on that as well. And then we'll have a discussion at Committee of the Hall. Okay. Just, just something like the uh, gymnastics, your worship there, like something to encourage them, the talks are now on as we speak. And, this other business that want to do the same thing. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Before I move on, Your, your Worship, I just uh, I neglected to, uh, to thank my past committee members in sustainability. Uh, that moved on and uh, 
of course, we'll be welcoming the new members here shortly. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? and engagement. Uh, there was no meeting. Uh, we didn't have, uh, there's no items to report on that. Uh, but uh, um, again, I, I want to thank the members of my of that committee who uh, will be moving on, uh, as well as um, welcoming uh, new members uh, to that committee. So uh, we are looking at having a meeting on uh, November 19th. Uh, so I'll have a report to the next council meeting. Human resources, any? Uh, Nothing, your worship, at this time, but there is a meeting scheduled for November 20th. Thank you. Any inquiries by members of council on any item uh, they'd like to raise at this time? If not, we'll move on to um, other committees. Uh, Stratford Seniors Complex, uh, House the Chair of that committee, uh, Council Gail McDonald, to uh, give her report. Uh, yes, your worship, the uh, reports in your package. Uh, everything's going good there at the uh, complex. Uh, Ostrich Brothers uh, have installed some new patio doors in three of the units and uh, bedroom windows for three other units as well. Uh, the finalized statements have been sent to CMHC for their approval. Uh, we've also awarded the walkway snow removal and salting to Cutting Edge this year for the 2020, 2021 winter season. Uh, we currently have a vacant unit, but we are going uh, through the list and uh, we'll have some identified soon. Uh, fall maintenance is being completed around the complex at this time. So everything's good there, Your Worship. Thank you. Do you, do you know offhand how many people are on the waiting list? Uh, I believe it is around 20, Kim. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments on the seniors report? I understand, yeah, Councillor McDonald, that uh, you'll be moving on. Deputy Mayor Clough, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you very much. They decided to award that to the more senior member of council. Can you make a report in the coming the new year? There's more involvement down there. Yeah, and we will be uh, we will be uh, including that in, in terms of our next uh, council council meeting uh, report. Okay, uh, we do have uh, the next item: appointments to the committees uh, and. Uh, there's a resolution. I'll ask uh, Deputy Mayor Clo um, to read that uh, resolution. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, CW010 2020 committee members appointment. Whereas Council has established a number of standing committees and subcommittees in the Council Procedural Bylaw, Bylaw number 27, to advise and assist Council in its deliberations. And whereas the bylaw provides for the appointment of residents and stakeholders by council to provide public input to council in its deliberation, be it resolved that the following residents and stakeholders be appointed to the standing committees and subcommittees for a two year term from December 1st, 2020 to November 30th, 2022, as follows. And through all the names. Um, do we need to read them into the record? Yeah. Well, bear with me, probably, but some of them <laughs> Okay, Accountability and Engagement Committee, uh, Juliana McEwen, Naomi uh, Milner, Rachel Patterson, Zachary Tweel, and Joan Walker for Accountability and Engagement. Finance and Technology, Ian Birch, Caleb L. Shimu, Shimi. Khalid El Shami. Thank you. Bernadette Milner, Charlene Morrison, and Pat Ryan, Finance. Infrastructure, Cliff Campbell, Alex Dial, Malcolm McKenzie, Nicole Phillips, and Tammy Wall. Active Transportation, Mike Duggan, Dennis Dunn, Colette Command, Sean McDougall, Holly Smith, and Josh Wheel. Planning, Development, and Heritage, Kathleen Brennan, Rob DePoise, Beth Grant, Joel Ives, and Daniel Nuffer. Heritage, Jane Ferguson, Elaine Goody, Gary Goody, Doug Kelly, and David Patton. Recreation, Janet Compton, Kyle Han, Ted Lawler, Stephanie Tweel, Ken Wakeman. Art and Culture, Elizabeth DePoise, Sandra McMillan, Sean McNeil, Gary Schofield, Della Wood. Events, 
Mike Chapman, Gordy Klo, Robin Camp, Adrian Montgomery, Debbie Reed, and Sarah Bolano. Safety service, Wilt McDonald, um, Melanie McCarthy, Melissa Patton, Rishi Sacker, Alan Sinclair. Sustainability, Angela Banks, Andrew Davies, Michael Fleshman, Adam Ramsey, Maria Skitslovakia. How'd they do? <laughs> Diversity and inclusion. Uh, Yearly, Bensu Sukuba. Sukubuka, I'm not sure. Bensuishka. What is it? Bensuishka. Okay, thank you. Roy Codley, 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 Frenzen, Rissell, Diane Sacker, uh, Pilak, Tikaboy, what is it? Tikaboy. Tikaboy. Thomas, Jamie Tikago. How they do? <laughs> Anyway, this resolution bears the recommendation of the committee the whole council meeting on October 28, 2020. So moved. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, uh, any discussion? Um, I just had one question. Is the fire committee uh, 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 so a separate meeting, I believe, the fire and the uh, seniors or fire committee is uh, still under negotiations. Okay. So we'll wait one month. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Is that the same with the seniors? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, any discussion? Any, anyone else? Okay, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary minded? Motion carried. Okay, uh, any proclamations? No proclamations. Any other business? Anyone would like to uh, add at this time? Okay, call for motion for adjournment. Aye. Now adjourned. Thank you. Richie was just asking me, he messaged me and he said where that's positioned, the way he did it. He was hearing it through the speaker, so I was just turning it on and off as people were going up. I was like, he was like, can you move the microphone? I go, I said, it's a, it's a, I have to move the podium too. He goes, oh no, no, just hit the mute button. Goddamn, still I can't get it to go. It's scared for me. Yeah, I saw that. It's weird, right? I, I keep researching it and every time I'm like, okay, this is going to be right, it. Right, right. This this I'll have to get maybe Scott to call me or something if he knows yeah. how to do it or yeah. send me the steps that he uses.